This is not a high-tech classroom or even a video arcade. It's the software test room at Electronic Arts. And these kids aren't playing games. They are testing game software. After all, who knows more about entertainment software than kids? Something magical happens when you put a child in front of a computer screen. And today we're going to explore that magical connection as we look at computers and kids on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles has been made possible in part by PC Connection and Mac Connection. Mail order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh. And the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me this week is Mimi Lee, a sixth grader at St. Veronica's School in South San Francisco. And Mimi, you're not only a student in the sixth grade, you're actually a software beta tester for the learning company. Yes. All right, what do they ask you to do? What do you do for them? Basically, before the program comes out in the stores, they ask me to test our program from the beginning till mm -hmm. the end and to see if they have any bugs, problems, or spelling errors. Did you find any mistakes when you were testing this one? Well, not really. Most of them are fine, except sometimes the game would black out in the middle or something. <laughs> a little crash here and there. All right, this is one of the games you worked on called Operation Neptune, and tell us what you do here. Well, right now I'm a submarine, and my station is signaling me that there's a problem, mm -hmm. and they want to know the input of the sub's average speed for the last six log entries. So you got to read that graph. Yeah, so I'll start with the 215s for number five entry and number six entry, that's 30. Then number four is 10, that's 40. Then number one is another 10, so that's 50. Number two is 20, so that's 70. And then number three is five, okay, so that's Okay, so you're adding five. them all up, we're going to find the average speed. Yes. So it's 75. Then divided, divided by, by six, six, and you get 12.5. Okay, so let's see if 12.5 is the right answer. So we've got to solve this math problem. Five. Okay. All right. So now we can get to play the game? Yes. And what are we doing here? I'm that orange submarine on the screen, uh -huh. and I have to try to... These little bad fishy guys are going to attack you? Yes. I try not to get hit because... Uh-oh, just like you did there. Yeah, I, I lose energy and oxygen uh -huh, when I get hit. Yeah, so basically, yeah. I try to get through everything without getting hit. But here, I'm at the end now. Uh-huh. Well, not the end, but yeah. the end of the first sector. And then you would get to solve another problem. Yes. Okay, that's pretty neat. All right, we are going to take a look at what kids can do with computers today. We'll meet several youngsters from age 9 all the way up to 14 and see the computer programs they have developed. Now, if you think kids and computers means Apple IIs in a classroom with 1980s software, think again. We're going to begin with a visit to one middle school that's running a national bulletin board for science students. These students at Foothill Middle School in Walnut Creek, California, are sharing their experimental data with other students around the country via the National Geographic Kids Network, a computer bulletin board created by and for science students. The kids find out that other kids who are doing the same types of things are getting the science, same kind of information, and so they're getting a reinforcement that they don't get just from, from their teacher, from me. The sixth graders in Mr. Parrish's class are studying water pollution. These eighth grade students are doing an experiment on temperature measurement using a collection of hypercard stacks called the E-Lab or the Electronic Laboratory Notebook. Before the computers, they were spending so much of their time doing the kind of mundane setup, not the science, but just those things that require a setup, watching a thermometer, watching a clock. And it wasn't until we got the computers into the classroom that I saw the kids begin to focus on what was happening in science rather than setting up the lab and just doing those kind of busy work type things. But how does using the computer affect what and how the children learn? Does it simply turn them into data entry technicians? The teacher says no. The computer, I think one of the things that it does is it allows the kids to explore their own ideas more uh, since they're not confined to a certain set of equipment. When they're on the computer, they're doing their processing, they're thinking through their writing. It allows them that chance to go back and reprocess. They can regraph their data. They can change the axes. They can look at it from different ways. So I think it makes them more creative. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel.
and children still in elementary school are developing innovative software. Here to show us their programs are fourth grader Stephanie Grush. And you're how old, Stephanie? Nine. Okay. And also with us, Kimiko Sakuma. And you are in what grade? Six. And how old? Eleven. At Eleven years old. And also with me over here is Greg Olszewski. And Greg, you're in fifth grade. And how old? Eleven. Okay. So we've got nine, eleven, and eleven here. All right. I want to ask each of you, before you show me your software, Stephanie, what is it about computers that you find so interesting? I mean, why do you spend your time playing with computers? I like the kinds of things that you can make them do. And, and sometimes I like years later to come to my stack and look at it and <laughs> Years think about later. It when I've forgotten what it is all about. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Kamiko? Why do you like to play with computers? Well, there's so much information in the computer, and every day you learn something new. So it's like a new adventure for you to take. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. And Greg, what would your answer be? I enjoy programming games on the computer that I play afterwards. So you like to play the games you've written yourself? Yes. Not depend on all these other professional guys to write all these games for you. All right, Stephanie, I want to go back to you. And you wrote a stack in HyperCard. And I want you to show it to us and, and tell us what it does. Well, go ahead. This is the First Light Times Table stack. Uh -huh. So when you open it up, it says, Welcome to First Light Times Table. Click on the teacher to begin. Okay. So I'll click on the teacher as labeled teacher. Okay, so what's this? This is the teacher card. You see it has a white background. Mm -hmm. And it quizzes and these, you. These, uh, these examples we have to do, like 5 times 2? Yeah, for instance, if I do 5 times 2, okay. then 10. Say and okay. say, OK. Right. It says right. OK. And now, um, if you get one wrong. OK, 4 times 2, that's pretty wrong. Yeah, and wrong. sorry, that's wrong. OK. And um, it'll give you a chance to say, what is it? And so I'll click on that button, and it says 8. Ah, uh, so it tells you what the right answer is. OK. Um, if you want to know. So what, what's the blackboard part of it? I see it and I... Uh, yes, this takes uh, you to yeah. the blackboard. So you go to the blackboard and uh -huh. I'll say, okay. And what and is this now? This lets you practice. You notice it has a gray background like for the blackboard. Yeah. And then I, I'll click on 3 times 3, Oh, nine, so you can practice. These are the answers eight, for you before you go take the test. 10 times okay. 10, 100. All right. All right, what's memory exercise? What is that part? Well, th that's where you click on these oh, covers. I see. You got to remember real fast what's under those covers. And then you do quiz. quiz. Okay. And what was under cover one? So I bet you know the answer. Write it. <laughs> so that was a flower. And then it says Mirror. right. Okay. And the next I see. one. And it says right. Uh huh. A diskette. Right. Okay, I'll just get four? this last one wrong. <laughs> okay. So I'll say H G G G G G. Yeah, yeah. I'll say wrong. wrong. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, I want to ask you to slide the keyboard and the mouse over to Kimiko because I want her to get her stack running. And while you're doing that, let me just ask you a question, Stephanie. I mean, you you not only are playing with HyperCard, you actually learned the scripting language in HyperCard, right? How did you do that? Well, I after we had just learned what HyperCard was, yeah. I went in and looked at the scripts that I saw in other people's stack. Yeah. That's how I learned. I just played around with that. So nobody taught you, just sort of poked around and saw what kind of languages, what kind of words they use to make their stack? Yeah. Okay, Kamiko, now show us what you have and what, what you developed in your stack. Okay. Okay, what is this? This is a duck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's going to swim across the water. Uh huh. Quack, quack. And it says quack, quack. 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 Yeah. <laughs> This program was created by the Saku Mass. This is the Keishi's ABC game. All right, would you, would you tell us how, why and how you wrote this stack, Nico? Well, I did this stack because I got interested from one of my mom's friends. Uh -huh. And she works at DCCG, mm -hmm. Technology Resources for People with Disabilities. Uh -huh. And her friend taught me how to do HyperCard. Uh -huh. And so I thought of doing a hypercard stack for my brother so he could learn his ABCs. Okay, so this is what you wrote for your brother to learn his ABCs. Yes. Okay, show us how it works. Okay, you can pick any letter, A uh -huh. through Z, and let's say we clicked on D. This is letter D. Okay, so it tells us the letter. And there's oh, there are things that begin with D. Yeah, and you can pick with, let's say, dolphin. Mm -hmm. D is for dolphin. And do a quick animation. And then that animation, too. Oh, that's great. And does your brother actually use it? Yeah. Huh. 
And how long did it take you to write all this? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. Well, it took me about two years, and I'm still not finished with uh. it because I'm still adding new things to it. What's the nursery rhymes button you have down there? I just thought of doing a nursery rhyme, and it's supposed to be Jack B. Nimble. Yeah. And oh, so you're sort of animating a nursery yeah. rhyme, Jack B. Nimble, Jack B. Cook, Jack jumped over the candlestick. And then so he turned right. on the light bulb. Okay. All right, Greg, it's your turn now, and you've got uh, a lot of credits on this deck. What, what is this thing? Tell me about the ca what the California Geography Project is. Um, I, with eight other people, we each selected an aspect of California and did a hypercard stack about it. Okay. I chose music, but other people chose things like art, baseball, and physical yeah. geography. Now, this is a pretty big program you, write, you wrote, too. And what's the size of this program you wrote? I think it's about a megabyte. Wow. <laughs> okay, so show us how it works. Well, um, I looked up each group I could find in the Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll, and then I classified them by sit uh -huh. city. So these are where the different cities in California where these groups came from. So you yeah, Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead. And if and you click on Grateful Dead, what happens? It takes me to a screen of them. Uh -huh. And using the Mac recorder, I um, recorded a clip of music. Wow. So you, you put the clip inside the program, you scanned in a picture, you've got the names of the people. So this is just this big database of California music groups, huh? Yep. Okay, and so show some other ones. Los Angeles have found Beach Boys. Uh -huh. They're, they were one of my favorite groups. And I also got a picture for them. Hmm. All right, now Greg, do you only play around with the Mac and work in HyperCard, or do you work with other... I, I, I also work on the IBM a lot. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I like to, I'm right, I'm trying to get a bulletin board to run. Oh, yeah? To do what? Um, to have people call and download software and uh -huh. play games. But it's not <laughs> working quite yet. <laughs> you going to run your own computer company when you grow up? <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughing. laughs> right, okay. All right, thank you all, Stephanie and Kamiko and Greg. All right, while grown-ups are still trying to define multimedia, some middle school students in Hillsborough, California, are using multimedia to develop classroom materials. These 7th and 8th grade students are using computers in class as part of their television arts curriculum. Before computers, it was unlikely that a middle school could afford the technology to run its own TV studio. But with low-cost Apple IIs and Macs, this class is now running a complete super VHS studio and post-production center. The goal of our program is that when students come out of here with a real awareness of the video world, that it sort of demystifies the process of visuals and text. And secondly, that students gain a little bit more of a critical eye, that when they look at something on television, they know it's not just magic. The students use the older Apple IIs as word processors for their scripts. They shoot material on standard VHS camcorders, and then they edit the tapes using a Macintosh 2 SI as a controller. The students here at Crocker School not only shoot and edit, but also create their own titles and animations on the computer using software like Macromind Director. Students love the computers. I find that as soon as I turn on the animation program, the students um, go right there and forget about shooting. Same with computers in our classrooms. If there's one computer in the classroom, it just doesn't seem to be enough. The class plans to eventually produce programs that will air on the local cable access channel. But the teacher says the real point in the multimedia class is to teach students to be critical thinkers and intelligent viewers. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. There are some teenagers who do more than just watch MTV and make a mess of their rooms, and we have living proof right here. This is Nathan Hickson, and Nathan, you're an eighth grader? Yes, I am. And, and Cupertino, I'm and how old are you? Fourteen. Okay, there's a real teenager, and this is Brian Larson, and what grade are you in, Brian? Seventh. And how old? Twelve. Okay, and back with us is Mimi Lee, and as I recall, you were a sixth grader. Yes. And how old, Mimi? Eleven. Okay, I want to ask you guys what I asked the, the kids in the first segment before. What is it about computers that, that makes it so worthwhile? I mean, there's all these things for a kid to do. You can you know, play ball, watch TV, do with music, and yet you guys spend a lot of time with a computer. Why, Nathan? Well, I spend a lot of time with my computer because I think it's very fun, and it teaches me lots of new things, mm -hmm. and I use my computer for many things like homework and all kinds of different stuff. 
So we actually use it besides playing around with yeah. it and developing things. How about you, Brian? Well, I use it to um, stop from being bored and <laughs> to keep my brother from being bored. <laughs> um, I've got this, this uh, series of stacks called Your Next Life, which uh -huh. is supposed to, be, supposed to predict what you're going to be in your next life. Oh, and you're predicting it for your brother? Yeah. Okay, what's it going to be, or a tree? Or my whole or, family. Or your whole family. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and Mimi, what about you? What's so interesting about computers? Well, I think computers are really interesting and educational, and while I'm learning stuff from the computer, it's also fun. So you just like, like to play with it? Yes. Yeah. You guys all play games with computers? Is that part of it? Yeah. 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 We've got one game. <laughs> Me too. Okay. All right, Nathan, let's start with you. And you're, you're in junior high school, and you developed a stack about ecology. First of all, tell, tell me the story of why you, you, you wrote this. Okay, we wrote this because we're trying to teach students like uh, around our age uh -huh. why it's good to recycle and why we, they need to recycle. And, and it's basically just trying to encourage us to recycle. Okay. And it's directed actually towards all age groups, but mainly to our age group. All right, so this was part of a school project. Right? Yeah. All right, show us then, then how your program works. Okay, how it works is it's just a hypercard stack, mm -hmm. and it's got a basic outline. And as an example, we'll go to aluminum. Uh -huh. And we got these pictures. They were scanned in with a scanner. A bunch of aluminum cans. And bunch, then you yeah. had your choices on the right there. And then there's, all, there's four choices. Tell me about it. It tells you about aluminum. Mm -hmm. And it, it just goes through a description of aluminum, how it's mined, what's, like, why is it easier to recycle it. And, and then you can go to what's the problem. And in what's the problem, it tells why we need to recycle it. Because mm -hmm. if we don't recycle it, there's going to be lots of problems. And it just gives a whole bunch of facts about alum like why we need to recycle aluminum. Right. And then under who cares, there's rec like companies that care about aluminum. They mm -hmm. want you want you to recycle it, and they help you and all kinds of stuff. And then you can add that to your resource list at the end of the stack. Mm -hmm. And then go back to al aluminum. And then let's recycle. And it tells about about how to make what's called a don't chuck it bucket. Huh. And you click on step one, and it goes through. You can click on each step, and it tells you how to make the bucket. And then, as another example, we'll go to glass, uh -huh. and it has another picture. And you can go to the four choices again. Like, we'll go to who cares again, and there's more different yeah. resources. Add it to your list, and go back to glass. Oh, and also, you can go to, after you add all these different companies, mm -hmm. go to your resource list, and there they all are, yeah. ready to copy into a word processor to print out, so hmm. you can write letters to them and stuff. Okay, you have a sort of game in there you, you wrote also, didn't you? Yeah, we What's have that? a game. It's called The Quick Cure. Okay. And wouldn't it be nice if we could just get rid of these problems by clicking on them? Go ahead. Try it. Okay, okay. I'll try to get rid of them. You don't? No. <laughs> doesn't seem to go away, does it? So what's the moral of the story? Yeah. <laughs> Give up. It doesn't really work, does it? It's the same in real life. We can't just make them go away. Ecology takes action. It takes a little work, not just clicking on some mouse button, huh? Yeah. All right, Nathan, I want to ask you to slide the mouse okay. over to Brian. And while you're setting up Brian, Mimi, if you were the beta tester here for, for Nathan's software program, what'd you think of that? What would you tell him? Well, I'd say that'd be really interesting, and that really could get teenagers to really think about it. Uh huh. So it's a good way to get kids involved in understanding the whole ecology thing. All right, now, Brian, you, you wrote something about Picasso, and, mm -hmm. and why Picasso? I mean, it's unusual for somebody who's into computers to also be into art. Like well, that. I wrote it on Picasso because I had to pick a famous person, uh -huh. and I had, I'm kind of into art. Oh, good. And um, I, had, well, just looking, our teacher gave us a list of names of who we could do, and I saw Picasso, and I said, hmm, why not? Okay, so show us how your stack works. Okay, so <coughs> we, we're on the title page here. And you can you can learn how to use this stack. Go to hyper, HyperCard Home uh -huh. to the menu or to the introduction, and we'll go to the introduction. And the introduction just tells just All basically about Picasso. About Picasso. Uh -huh. And then you go to the menu, and from the menu you can, you can pick a topic to go to. And then here we'll just pick Cubism. And then here's a scanned in image which I scanned in, and then tells a little bit about his Cubism period. Here's some more pictures. Mm -hmm. And here's another picture, and you can pick uh, after you're done. So with you all scanned this. all these in. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you can pick one of where you want to go from here. But I'm going to go to the menu. Uh huh. And then once you're in the menu, you can pick different places. And I'm going to special reports. Okay. And this is three musicians, and that's one of the um, paintings Picasso did. He's got two of them. This is another mm -hmm. version. And then th this is Guernica, which he painted after he heard 
news of the Germans bombing the town of Guernica. Uh -huh. And you can see all the violence in there. Yeah. And this is Les Demoiselles de Avagon, which means the ladies of Avagon. And he was inspired by um, Paul Cezanne's <coughs> Bathers. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go back to the menu now. And then here we go back, we go to pictures. Here's a picture of Picasso. Uh -huh. And then here's one of his bullfights, which he did was when he was like really little. Mm. So it's pretty good for a little kid. Yeah. And here's another one. And then this is Vive La, which he painted when he heard when he heard news of Germany declaring war on France uh -huh. in World War One, and he painted um, Vive La and then France's flag underneath it. And Vive La means long live, and then France's flag, so he wants long live yeah. France, even though he's born in Spain. He spent yeah. most of his life in France. Uh -huh. That's. Okay. My stack. Now, now, Brian, you said you said you do some of this stuff to keep from being bored. And what, yeah. what about learning? I mean, it sounds like a pretty neat, unboring way to learn about Picasso. Is, is, did you learn about it by, in fact, writing the yeah. software? Yeah. Usually, when I do regular reports, I don't. Um, I just type it out to get um, rid of it. <laughs> I mean, just to do it. Yeah, right. And um, for this, um, I actually had fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. Even though there's your part. And would other kids in your class then use the stack and also learn from that? Um, my teacher said she she'll use it in the future, to um, because uh -huh. she's this is the first time she's ever done well had kids do hypercard, and she'll just give this as an example. Yeah. What do your parents think about the about all the time you spend with computers, Mimi? What, is, what do your parents say to you? Um, my parents think when I'm playing games, that it's just a waste of time. <laughs> okay. But when I'm doing something educational and something fun for me, they think that's really good instead of like going outside and playing baseball or <laughs> getting hurt or something. <laughs> It's much uh, safer and it's more fun mm -hmm. and educational. What about your your house, Nathan? Well, my parents think I spend too much time <laughs> time on the computer, but I don't really think so. And they're kind of like it whenever I do homework and educational stuff. Yeah. And they think it's a waste of time again when I do games. <laughs> and Brian, you? Well, um, I don't really do any games on the computer. Really? Yeah. Um, well, I've, we've got one game, but I'm kind of bored with that right now. Oh. And um, but right now I'm just. Um, making this game for my brother uh -huh. because I was bored with the other game and so is he and um, I can't get on the computer because it's tax time and my dad's doing <laughs> the taxes are on his computer so I'm not getting much time on it. Alright you'll be getting your computer back soon I'm sure that Brian. Nathan and Brian and Mimi thank you all very much for being here. That is our look at computers and kids. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news on Random Access. In the random access file this week, this is a special summer edition with the focus on software. Here are last week's best-selling software titles for the Macintosh according to Mac Connection. Managing your money is number one, followed by After Dark 2.0, the Excel 4.0 upgrade, Norton Utilities, and Auto Doubler. Rounding out the top ten are After Dark and the More After Dark Bundle, the System 7 upgrade, Quicken, and the Word 5.0 upgrade, and Disk Doubler. Next up, Paul Schindler and our summer software review. Instead of our usual software, let's take a look at a piece of hardware that makes color software look good, the Toshiba 4400. It only weighs 7 pounds, much less than previous color notebook computers. Note there's no power cord. This machine runs for up to 3 hours on its battery. Until now, your choice was poor color and batteries or good color and an AC cord. Now you can get good color and battery operation. Finally, get a load of this color. It may be hard to tell at home, but this is terrific color, better than many desktop machines. The Toshiba T4400 SXC is a pricey $8,000, but if you need 256 colors to make your point portably, it's the best way to go. It can replace your desktop machine. It comes from Toshiba America in Irvine, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Janelle Stelson. Computer Chronicles has been made possible in part by PC Connection and Mac Connection. Mail order software and hardware peripherals for the PC and the Macintosh. And the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated, plus background information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a subscription to the newsletter, call 1 800 366 9484 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. 
All orders include a free software program for auditing software use.